I've always wondered, do vegetarians eat animal crackers? If a number two pencil's so popular, why is it still number two? Do bald people get dandruff? Why are power outages reported on TV? That makes no sense. But some questions are more meaningful than others. How do I handle all the stress in my life? How do I discover God's will for my life and live it out every day? I have a hard time dealing with disappointment. What does the Bible say I should do? How can I be the parent my kids need me to be and the one God wants me to be? What does the Bible say about dealing with difficult people? Because I know some. Are we actually living in the end times? What does that mean for me? So we turn to the one who has all the answers. We'll examine some of our biggest questions and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. All right, we're continuing with our series. We're on week number three called You Asked For It. And I just want to explain what is it all about, You Asked For It. And if you remember Jesus, sometimes his disciples would say, hey, Jesus, how do we pray? And so they would ask him, and they asked for it, and he would give them a teaching. And so what we've done, uh, it's kind of the same thing, sort of, is I'm not Jesus, though, but it's kind of the same thing. You ask questions, and on Easter Sunday... Any Sunday, we usually have about 60% of our folks that show up, and other ones do not. So not everyone shows up at once. But on Easter Sunday, pretty much everyone shows up at once. We had over 700 people here that we gave a survey to on Easter Sunday and asked you, what are the topics that are most important to you? And so we've been doing that. We're in the third week. The first week was the following. How do I deal with stress? And I'm sure by now, as I mentioned last week, now you have no more stress in your life because you came to the service. Right? Okay, you guys, are not, you, guys get, you guys are a hard audience. Okay. Uh, anyhow, so that's what happened. You're not an audience, you're family. All right. But that was the first week. Second week was, how do I find my purpose? And, you know, having a purpose helps you stay on track. Otherwise, the Bible says, without a heavenly vision, the people cast off restraint. So we talked about that last week. Now, this week is perhaps my number one question that I struggle with. Maybe I'm the only one. Is this, how do I really change? How do I really change? How many of you experience that? You want to see change in your life? You want to stop eating so much or eating too little? You want to stop drinking or smoking or gambling or blessing the pastor? No, no, you want to stop doing that. But you do various things, and it's hard to stop doing. You, you, you say, okay, I want to get right with God. I, you know, I'm, for so long, I've been trying to read my Bible and pray. You do good for about two weeks, and then you fall out of sorts, and you feel bad about yourself. You've been trying to read through the Bible. You never get out of Genesis 5. And he just goes on and on and on. You say, I'm going I'm to work. I'm going to spend more time with my children because I know they're growing up fast. And so what happens? You have more responsibility at work and you spend less time with your children. You feel bad about it. Maybe some of you are saying, this year I'm going to find someone special. And you haven't found anyone special yet. Or maybe you're saying, this year our marriage is going to be healed. And it doesn't get healed. It gets worse. And we're like, how do I change? How do I make things better? And so that's all part of the problem that we often faced. How do we do that? And it often is an area of frustration, is it not? I want to change, but I'm not changing. And it gets to the point that not changing can become part of your identity, isn't it? If you think about that, this is the way it's going to be. I, I've, I've tried to stop. I've tried to stop spending money I do not have. I'm still in debt, and I just can't. I'm compulsive about it. Or maybe some of you are trying to Maybe lose a little weight. Now, I, I can identify with that. Uh, just this past week, uh, Sandra and the kids and, and uh, my mother-in-law, they went to an apple orchard. God bless their hearts. And they, came, they brought home cider donuts. <laughs> this is last night. And I came home and I was busy and I did not have a chance to eat dinner. And they were all out. I came in there and I, I saw the cider donuts and the little plastic thing. And I, I smelled it. I pulled the refrigerator open. I got a glass of milk. And boy, that was, I said, I'll just have a little piece so I broke off a little piece of the donut. Boy, that's good. Praise the Lord. So I took another piece of the donut. Two and a half donuts later, they're gone. So uh, Sandra goes, oh, where are the cider donuts? I said, well, I got rid of them, honey. I didn't want you to see them because I know we're working on our way. She says, where are they? So I hit them. Where are they? In my stomach. So anyhow, uh, I was worried I wouldn't be able to wear these pants this morning as a result of that. <laughs> but how many of us have tried these crash diets? You lost 20 pounds, you gained 40 back. You lose 20 pounds, you gain 40 back. It's like, you know, it's amazing. 17 years of a woman's life is spent trying to lose weight according to the statistics we showed a couple of weeks ago. So you, you want to change. You want to go to the gym. You want to get in shape. You want to get your marriage in shape. You want to be able to, okay, this year I'm not going to be such a loner. I'm going to find people to hang 
hang out with. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop doing this and the other. This is it. I'm going to change. And perhaps the biggest time of the year this happens is when? January. Memberships at gyms go way up. And so people say, I'm going to join a gym. They join a gym. You go to the gym. The treadmill has a line down the hall. You're like, I can't even get on the treadmill. So just wait a couple of weeks. Go in February. It's half the, half the line. And by the, by the time April rolls around, you have the place to yourself. It's wonderful. Why? Because we all have good intentions. We want to see change. We, our heart's in the right place. We want to do the right thing, but we do not see it happen. And it can become frustrating, whether it's a small thing like eating cider donuts, but maybe some of you say that's a big thing. Well, maybe to you it is. It's a small thing to me. Leave me alone. You have your own vice. Anyhow, so <laughs> that's what begins to happen, right? And you get frustrated with it. And what can happen is your identity is wrapped up in what you're not able to change. Let me say that again. Your identity gets wrapped up in what you're not able to change. I just can't seem to change this weight issue, this health issue, this marriage issue, this relationship issue. I just can't stop to worry. I just can't stop to complain. I just can't stop to be so materialistic. Whatever a device is, whatever the device is, whatever you're struggling with. I have a friend of mine that I go to their house and it's amazing. It's like going to Bally's. They have everything. You go in the basement, they have, uh, they have two treadmills, not one, but two. And they have, they have a TV there, they have a surround sound, five point one with a subwoofer. And it's amazing. And they have these special LED lights and it's beautiful. They have all these wonderful things. And I say, when are you going to use it? Oh, I'm going to start next week. I've been hearing it for 20 years from the person. No one in this church. Anyhow, and then you go to our garage sale. You see all these, what, the butt master, the thigh master, and now all these things are getting rid of. Why? That Jack Elaine, remember who Jack Elaine was? And, and, and all these things, the Chuck Norris thing. And you're selling them. Why? Because we all have good intentions, but we do not follow through. We don't see the change we want to see, and it becomes frustrating. So many people say, you know, I'm tired of changing. I'm done changing. And it becomes part of your identity. And one of the things I really appreciate about the 12-step programs, which were Christ-based in, in the early days, is if you're an alcoholic, for example, you go and say, hi, my name is Eric, and I'm an alcoholic. No, I'm not an alcoholic, but for the purpose of this the illustration today, hi, my name is Eric, I'm an alcoholic. And now, you may not have drank for 35 years, but if you go to one of those meetings, this is what you say. Hello, my name is Eric, I'm an alcoholic. Now, there's something good about that process. I'll tell you, the, the thing that's good about it is you own it. Before you can change something, you have to own it. You have to identify it, you take ownership of it, say, yes, there is a problem. But there's a real problem, I believe, in saying that you are an alcoholic for the rest of your life. Because for those who are in Christ Jesus, our new creation, the old has passed away, behold, all things are new. And so what I, you should say, your sin, does not de 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 your sin does not define you. Excuse me. Your Savior defines you. Let me say that again. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. So you can say, yes, I used to struggle with alcohol 35 years ago. I found freedom. It's an area that I battle. But Christ, I am, I am a believer in God. And I'm an overcomer in Christ Jesus. You see the difference? So your sin does not define you. Your Savior, if you're giving your life to Christ, does. So that's, that's really, I think, encouraging. But if you're not seeing that, what the next step is, you start feeling hopeless. Like, what's the sense of trying? I, I try to get close to God. I try to give my life to God. I tried to tithe, and I lost my job. Uh, the car broke down. Nothing seemed to work for me. It doesn't work for me. I tried to, I tried to be nice to him or her. I, I tried to help my children. I tried to help my parents. I tried to, to, to work and do the right thing, and it doesn't work out. And you start feeling hopeless about it. You said, I've tried for decades. I'm getting nowhere. And then what happens is, after that, the first stage is, and we mentioned the first stage is you try to stop and it becomes part of your identity. The second thing is you, you feel hopeless about it, and then you get so tired of people and yourself being disappointed that you say, now you get irritated if someone mentions it. Now, you all know somebody, there's something really obvious about their life, but you just don't go there. You just don't mention it. I mean, they, you could say, you know, you have a green head. You don't tell them they have a green head. You know, or there's an issue, there, there's, a, there's a boundary line, do not cross or else. And so you don't talk about it anymore. You don't talk about that issue with that person because the person gets defensive. I think you might have a problem with drinking. I don't have a problem with drinking. Okay, all right. I, I think you have a problem with buying things. You, no, I don't have a problem with that. And you just say, okay, I'm not going to go there anymore. It's not worth it anymore. 
you shouldn't be so rough on your husband or wife. Hey, don't you talk to me about that. So you just stay away from it, and they become defensive. If you become defensive, then there's no way for it to change, is there? And then the final thing, that, the final thing happens is this. You become a slave to the change you're trying to see. See, when you're a slave, you're controlled by someone that you cannot control. They control you. Maybe it's a slave of negativity. Maybe it's a slave of uh, a diet issue or a health issue. Maybe it's a slave of a relationship. Maybe it's a slave of watching things you shouldn't be watching and going places you shouldn't be wa doing. And it becomes a slave to you. If anyone ever found out, I'm doomed. And this thing controls you and you're always worried. Will I be uncovered? Will I get in trouble? And you're living with this, this little secret that is just blackmailing you and you feel like you're a jerk for allowing yourself to get involved with it, but you've gotten so deep you're afraid to mention to anybody. Maybe you, you're, you're caught in a lifestyle that you know is wrong. But man, I, I, I've tried to change for years and I feel beat up. I feel like there's something wrong with me and I, I don't feel like a human being. Surely it's okay. And you get involved with a certain thing or certain lifestyle, a certain type of thing, whatever it could be. It doesn't make a difference what it is. But it controls you. And it gives you shame. And you're defensive. And then what happens after that? You become a slave. Then you start saying, life is nothing but a burden. I can't seem to get rid of these weights that are on my back. And you start thinking, if I could just change this one area, then everything would change. How many of you would say that today? If there's this one area, if I could just change this one area, life would be different. If I could just stop eating those cider donuts, life would be different. By the way, please do not give me any cider donuts unless they're fresh. <laughs> How do I change? You know, I love the Apostle Paul. I love the Bible because the Bible is so real and so true. It shows us people just like you and I. The Bible says Elijah was a man just like us. And there is a passage of Scripture, hands down, is the best passage of Scripture in dealing with the frustrating problem of wanting to see change and not seeing it happen. And it happened by a wonderful man by the name of the Apostle Paul. You might have heard of him. He wrote a third of the New Testament, one of the most outstanding individuals that ever was, that ever walked the planet. And I'm going to read from the Bible. I'm not going to use this. I just have this up here to make the religious people happy. So you don't have a Bible here. But uh, I do have the Bible here. Okay, it makes it easier because it's, the print's too small. So wait till you turn 47. Okay, let's move on. So the Apostle Paul gives a, uh, basically a description of wanting to change something in his life, and he's finding it very difficult to change. And I find it absolutely amazing because I can completely identify on what he's saying. I think you will too if you're being honest with yourself. Let's go ahead and read it. So here's the Apostle Paul talking about. We don't know what it is. It says this. So the trouble is not with the law. Now what's the law? The law is the word of God. The right way to do things, the wrong way to do things. And by the way, when God gives us a law, he does it for our own good. The reason why it's important to put oil in your lawnmower when you buy it because if you don't, you'll blow the engine. I know that from first-hand experience, okay? It wasn't that the uh, yard master was a jerk to me. No, they said, put oil in the, and it didn't happen, happen a number of years ago, okay? And he said, put oil in, that's judgmental. No, it's the right way to do it. It's a law, right? But I didn't do it, and I suffered the consequences. And so when God gives us laws, he does not give it to hinder our life. He gives it to give us greater life. So here the apostle Paul knows the right thing to do, and it's what he says. So here's the trouble. It's not with the law, for it's spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. Now, some of you need to have realized that. <laughs> if you know someone like that, that's probably you, all right? Um, the trouble's with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I really don't understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But, I, but if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So listen, I know the right way to go. I know it's wrong for me to spend money I don't have. I know it's wrong for me to look at these things. I know it's wrong for me to say these things. I know it's wrong for me to drink these things and take these things and gamble these things and whatever it is. I know it's wrong. Verse 16. But I know that what I'm doing is wrong. This shows that I agree that the law is good. Verse 17. So I am not the one doing it wrong. 
It's the sin living in me that does it. Now, this is not, not giving responsibility, but what this is doing is, is recognizing that your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. The Apostle Paul did not let the enemy tell him that you are this because you struggle. Because you struggle with drinking, you're an alcoholic. Because you struggle with gambling, you're a gambler. Because you struggle with uh, obesity, you're, you're, you're an obese person. No, it, that's not your identity. Your identity is found in Jesus Christ. And he understands the disparaging, the difficulty, the gulf that stands between who he is and his struggle. And he understands that it's not his desire to do this. His desire is to do the right thing, but this old nature is screaming at him and controlling him. Can anyone identify today? Am I the only one? It's awfully quiet in here this morning. He says, I'm not the one, verse 17, I'm not the one doing wrong. It's the sin that lives in me that does it. And I know that nothing lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm really not the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Can anyone say an amen? amen. Shame on you. <laughs> Just having fun with you. Verse 22. The love of God's law, I love God's law with all my heart. I love the scriptures. I love what the scripture says. It resonates. I know it's right. But there is another power within me that's at war with my mind. It all happens up here first, doesn't it? What happens here gets to here and eventually finds its way here. Mind, heart, hands. Usually that's the pattern where it's really ingrained in your life. There's another power that's in work in my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that's still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? Of course, there's an answer to that, which I'll share in a few moments. So what's, how do we find change? How do we find change? Well, I just happen to have on a $100 bill, good old Benjamin Franklin, one of my favorite presidents for this reason. I really appreciate that he fits himself. By the way, this is not my $100 bill. This is Mike House's $100 bill. <laughs> I asked him for it, he gave it to me. He's not getting it back. Anyhow, so, <laughs> so this is a $100 bill. Now, if, 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 if I ask you, I said, I want change. How do I get change from this $100 bill? Tell me. I gotta break it, don't I? How do I break it? I have to give it to somebody that can give me the change I want to see. I can't have the change until I exchange. You do not have change until you break through an exchange. It's real simple. I mean, it's obvious with this, isn't it? You cannot get change without an exchange. And so you and I, in our life, today's message is all about breaking from something and changing what we're going to do. There is no change without breaking. Philippians says this. Actually, before we do that, the first thing we need to do is this. We need to break from ourselves. You're not going to see lasting change according to God unless you break with yourself first. It's found in Romans 6, verse 12. You please put that up there. I'd appreciate it. Romans 6, verse 12 says the following. Do not let sin Control the way you live. Do not give into sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, listen to this, give yourselves completely to God. It doesn't say partially. It doesn't work, by the way. This whole thing of Christianity, if you tried it and you try to give half, it doesn't work. You gotta give it all, it doesn't work. It just does not work until you give it everything. Until you, go, until you go in all the way, it's not gonna work here. And so the Bible says, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. It said, give yourself completely to God. Sin is no longer your master. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. So what you need to do is you need to break from yourself and connect to God. 
That's the first. If we want to see change, that has to be the one. Listen, it's not all about finding the power within. If, if you try to find the power within, guess the problem with finding the power within? If you find the power within, guess where the power comes from? It comes from within. And guess what? You're limited in your power. You're limited in your scope. And so many of us have tried for so long to change by our own self. The problem is you become the God. Look within. Well, look within, good luck, because you're going to have to use your own strength. Instead, disconnect from yourself and connect to God, who, by the way, is limitless. The Bible says the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead resides in you. If God can raise up a dead body, he can raise up your shame and bring healing to you. But it can't happen until we disconnect from ourselves and connect to God. You see, there's a big difference. Yes, the New Age movement, Buddhism, disconnect from it all. Okay, that's cool. That's great. Become nothing. That's great. But you need to plug in something better than yourself. And that's God, who's the author of your life. So that's a break from yourself. Realize your life is not your own. You know what it says in, like it says in Philippians 3.13. Listen to this. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But what I do focus on one thing, forgetting the past. In other words, breaking from the past. The connotation is just the same, forgetting and breaking from the past, breaking from the shame of your past, breaking from the way you used to do things, forgetting the past. I look forward to what lies ahead. I press to reach the end of the race. He breaks from the past, right? He presses forward to what? What does he press forward? He presses for the heavenly prize, which is in Christ through what? Jesus Christ. So you need to break from yourself, you need to throw your anchor in Christ, and you need to press on towards Christ to break from the past. That's the exchange. To see change, there has to be an exchange. You have to hand this in. You say, okay, I have this $100 bill. I'm going to hand it in. I'm going to exchange it for something else. No, you can't have it. It's not mine. It's Michael's. I might keep it. All right. Break for yourself. The Bible says also in Romans 6, 12 through 14, this is what it says. Do not let sin control the way you live to give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God. Your life is not your own. The Bible also says the following. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I hear people say to me all the time, Pastor, how come we don't, have a, we don't have a big cross? Well, if you look at all the windows have crosses, but we need a cross in the church. It's not church unless we have a cross. Well, we have a cross. But you know what? That's not that important. This is a building. I know we just put up a building. I understand that. We're building another building. I understand that. It's just a building. A building is a tool. And so what well, we shouldn't do, we're doing that in church. That's a holy place. And I would say to you, if you can't do it here, you shouldn't do it here. Why? Because the Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if someone says that's not the right to do that in church, then it isn't the right to do it here. Who cares about a building? I, I mean, I care, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but compared to yourself, this is what it really matters. The Bible says, do you not know you're the temple of the Holy Ghost? So if you wouldn't watch uh, a movie here, then you shouldn't watch it here. If you don't use that kind of language here, you shouldn't use it here. If you don't look at that here, you should look at it here. You, you see the difference? It's about the body of the Holy Ghost. So what does the Bible say? It says, you not realize your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself for you're bought with a price, so you must honor God with your body. And that's one thing. Now, let me tell you something else that might encourage you, okay? You need to break. We understand that. But do you also realize something else about breaking? Breaking, there's no change without breaking. Breaking from yourself and connecting to God is this. You know, a horse has zero value to a person until it's what? A horse has to be broken first. You and I have very little usable value to God until we become broken. That doesn't mean you walk around like this, how you doing? Well, I'm a Christian, I'm broken. I'm just a loser, I'm broken, nothing's right. No, we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is broken to be utilized by God, where you finally realize you're not your life, you're not your own, you've been bought with a price. A horse is only good when it's broken. And my friends, your life and my life will only make a difference for God when we get to the place where we're broken. And that's a good thing. 
to be broken before God. And this is what I've learned. I don't trust too many people unless I see they've been broken. When I hear someone say, oh yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Oh, I can do this, I can do the other. And they're really confident and, and they, can, they can sing up a wall, they can preach up a wall, they can teach out of a, up a wall, they're amazing. They can, you know, they can preach so well that paint falls off the walls. They're incredible. But are they broken? Had they ever come to a place where they realize it wasn't about them, it was about God. And when that happens, I can trust the person. Until I see someone limping, like Jacob, who wrestled with the angel, I really don't trust. My friend, I had an opportunity to be broken. And I continually have to allow myself to be broken so I can be of some value. My friends, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about walking around, oh, I'm just broken. No, it's broken of yourself so God can ride you into the kingdom where he has you to be, where you can be powerful beyond yourself. You get a break from yourself. Breaking from yourself, the Bible talks about. And something else I want to mention to you as well. Stop being so hard on yourself. The enemy is really good at this. He'll get you to say, look at that cider donut. Sandra's with the kids putting them in the bed. There's a glass of milk in the refrigerator. It's 2%, so at least it's not full. So it's okay. And he'll tell you that, and, you, and then you'll have it. Doesn't that taste good? Oh, man, that's good. You have another one. I wish I had a cup of coffee with, but there's no coffee at this time of night. So I drink another one, and then when I'm done, oh, man, I shouldn't have eaten that. What was wrong with me? Yeah, you, you have no self-control. Your wife's going to put you sleeping on the couch tonight. No, that didn't happen, by the way. That didn't happen. Okay, but you know what I'm saying? The enemy will tempt you, and then when you do it, he'll accuse you. He's called the accuser of the brethren. It makes you feel guilty. And you feel so guilty, you say, what's the sense of changing? I'm tired of feeling guilty, I'll just give in. No, that's what it's not about. Don't be so hard on yourself. God loves you and he wants to see you do well. And so if you're gonna fall and make a mistake, it's okay. Take one thing at a time. If you try to change everything at once, you'll have no power to take any change at all. Just stop it. Listen, think of a couple of things. Just think of one thing today that you can walk out of here today and say, I wanna see God change. And just forget about the rest for now. Just focus on one thing. Listen, when you're in debt, it's so nice. If you've ever been in debt, we had a situation one time, and this credit card thing was a pain, you know? I'm going to pay that sucker off. So we say, we're poor, we're poor, we're going to have beans, we're going to stop having steak and, and rice, and we're going to pay that sucker off. And we paid that sucker, and it felt good to focus on that one bill. Now, you're going down, and, the, and that bill went down, and it felt better. I put all of our concentration on that thing. Don't try to change everything at once. You change one thing at a time. It builds your confidence level up, number one. It gives you a sense of victory, because we like to win. So don't try to change everything at once, because you only have so much energy to go about. And even God, take one thing at a time. He's very patient with the Israelites. He'll be patient with you as well. So stop being so hard on yourself. And then what do we need to do? We need to break from wrong thinking, and we need to break to right thinking. That's the second thing today. We change first by changing how we think. How you think is the software that runs the hardware of your life. And so we have to change how we think. And what does the Bible say about that? Well, the Apostle Paul says the following in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you. In other words, hey guys, listen up here. Brethren, by the mercies of God. I love that. He doesn't say change by yourself. He says change by the mercies of God. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. And do not be conformed or shaped to this world, but be transformed, which is the same word for metamorphosis in the Greek, metamorphosis, transformed by how? By renewing your mind that you may prove what's right. So the way, if you want to see change, you have to change the way you think. How you think you shall become in many ways. But there's something I also noticed about that. Okay, you need to change what you think. So what are you thinking about? What are you focusing on? That's all cool. But there's something else I've noticed. My grandparents, my grandfather was born in 1898. German, from Germany, he was a shop owner. His father was a shop owner. His father was a shop owner. Now, my brother has a shop owner. It goes on the line. Wonderful people, came to the United States of America, worked hard, and made a life for themselves. But this is what began to happen. You see, you have to not only do something, you also have to break with something in the past. What is that supposed to mean? Well, just give me a moment. I'll explain to you what I mean. My grandfather's generation thought this way. They thought that it didn't make a difference really what you said, it's what you did. Some of you grew up that way, where maybe your father or grandfather never said to my, my, my mother grew up, and my grandfather did not say he loved my mother until she was like 90. 
He just, he just guys, didn't, it's John Wayne. You didn't do that. You walk by well again, you go, and you bring home, you, you pay for the food, you, 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 you show affection a little bit, but you do not say, I love you. It just was not done. He, he says, it doesn't make a difference what I say, it's what I do. And so that generation put a premium on what? Premium on action, not just intention. And they said, my intention proves my heart. The reason why I'm, bringing, I'm taking care of you and putting food on the table is because I love you. And so that's my, how I communicate to you, all right? That's how that generation was. And some of you grew up that way, and some of you are still struggling with that because they never say I love you. Then we have the baby boomers. We have Generation X and millennials. And they tend to be, especially millennials, it's all about your heart. It doesn't make a difference what you do. It's all about if your intention's correct. So I meant to pay the electric bill. It was in my heart, but I didn't do it. Guess what happens to the power company if you do not pay your electric bill? Okay. Get on the phone and tell them, but my heart, I, I paid for it in my heart. <laughs> that doesn't work, does it? But why do we do that with church and God? Well, it was, it was my intention to do that. No. You see, now make no mistake, you can, for example, you can do the right thing and not have the heart, but at least it gets done, <laughs> right? In our generation, we want to be genuine, and I appreciate that about our generation and the generation that's here. We want to be genuine. We want to be real. So it doesn't make a difference what you do. It's all about your intention. But this is what I have found in life. It's not my, only about the intention of my heart. It's the direction of my feet that determine where I go. So if I want to go to Florida for vacation, go to Disney World, it's my desire to go there. I have the heart to do it. But I get in the car with my family and pack up everything. We have our Mickey Mouse ears and the whole thing. And I start driving to Maine. And someone says, uh, Dad, where are you going? We're going to Disney World. You're driving to Maine. I know, but in my heart, we're going to Disney World. I tried. It didn't work. It's a lot cheaper that way. But anyhow, <laughs> so what happens is you, it's not only your heart, it's the trajectory of where you're going that determines where you go. So there, there's a misnomer. In the old generation, it was like our actions speak for what's in my heart. Well, the new generation would say it doesn't make a difference what you do as long as you're sincere. And now what's the real truth of it? The truth, truth is this. If your heart is changed, that's awesome, but it's not good enough. Now we need to put it in gear. So you change your mind, and then you have to just do it, as Nike says. That's all part of the price. Break to right doing, not just right thinking. I love what I read about this. I read in, in November 2014, the Food and Drug Administration released its rule for calorie counts at chain restaurants. So when you go to Chipotle, which I love, you'll see a, a burrito and it says 1,000 calories. And you get the vegetarian one, 200 calories. Go with the meat. Okay. But anyhow, <laughs> so you know what you're getting yourself involved. You go to McDonald's. So there's 8,000 calories for, for a cheeseburger with fries. Then you see the McNuggets. And you're like, that's only 300, but that's not real meat. But nevertheless, and so you choose that. And so now we can make intelligent choices. And they made it a rule. In fact... After New York required labels, they were one of the leaders in this area. In 2008, 84% of the residents said they found the labels helpful. And 93% of the people in public health clinic samples saw menu labeling as extremely important for the health of its citizens. And a majority of Americans said they would choose lower calorie foods if they only knew what was there. So they were excited about that. But unfortunately, there's one big problem with food labeling. It doesn't seem to change what we eat. Research is reviewed. 31 studies published between 2007 and July 2013 that explored how calorie labeling influenced consumer choice, and they found it made little to no difference at all. Just because you know it, you shouldn't be eating that Big Mac doesn't mean anything if you're putting it in your mouth. Okay, so not just knowing the information, but choosing to walk in the right information is part of it. So if you want to see change, yes, God, I give my life to you, and I do all that, but we have to begin to walk it out. Faith without what is dead? As works are important, my friends, but you need to have the faith. So I want to conclude. Jesus says something here, very true. He says this in John 8, 31, 32. Can you put that up there, please? Jesus said to those Jews who believe in him, if you abide in my word, abide means stay in my word, 
That's why, my friends, living in God's words and abiding, it's something that you just do. It's something you become. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now let me say when it says you shall know the truth, it's the Greek word gnosko, which also has its kin uh, in the in Septuagint, which is also the Hebrew version. It says yada. And when it says gnosko and yada, what it basically means is this. It doesn't mean just intellectually spouting out a, a rote answer as you would in an exam. It means you know it. For example, if I say, yeah, I know that's a, that's a pool over there. I know Mixville Park. It's, it's a pond. I know all about it. Say, in the biblical sense of gnosko, it would not be gnosko until I jumped into Mixville Pond and swam. Now, not only do I know about it, but I'm swimming in it. Do you see the difference? So when the Bible talks about knowing something, it's not just knowing information. He says, you shall know the truth, and when you know the truth, you do the truth, and knowing and doing sets you free. It's important that your heart is in the right place. You can do the right thing and have no heart. So we're not saying one or the other, it's, it's both. But don't deceive yourself, just having the right intention is not good enough. It's a start, it's an important start. But not only do we need to know the right thing, we need to do the right thing. Real change comes from information that turns into transformation by hearing and doing. God honors His Word. So, how do we change? I want to encourage you, you need to break from yourself, connect to God. That's all part of it. You need to break to right thinking. You need to break to right doing. And finally, you need to break to community. Jesus says that we are his body. Christ is the head. If you want to see real change, it doesn't happen all by yourself. And it happens through the body. Christ has purposely, God has purposely limited the capacity of you and I. And our success and failure is based upon our connecting to him and connecting to each other. We're not called to live this life and change all by ourselves. I know it sounds noble and it sounds cool and it's romantic, but it's not true. You see in scripture, men and women changing in community, not by themselves, as long as they're connected to God. I want to encourage you, if you're not involved with a small group, we have those our green cards out in the lobby, get connected. Is it the answer to everything? No, but it's a start. Don't live this life by yourself. The Bible says evil do not be deceived. Evil company corrects good character. If you want to change, you need to change who you're hanging out with. You need to change the people you're spending time with. If you don't want to see real change in your life. Let's all stand if we could. I love what the Bible says here. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, all of us in this room are watching live or later on have faced the frustration of wanting to change and not seeing it happen to the degree and the capacity we would like. And Father, we thank you that you're, you're bigger and greater than our sin problem. You're bigger than that. We thank you that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Father, that you give us the strength that we need. You forgive us our sins. We thank you we confess our sins. You're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. We thank you that if we are in you. We are a new creation. Our sin does not define us. Our Savior defines us. And we hold on to you, God, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for us this morning that we would disconnect from ourselves, connect to you, disconnect from wrong thinking, connect to right thinking, disconnect from ourselves and be connected to others and see real life change happen. In Jesus' name. I'm going to give you an opportunity to give your life to Christ if you've never done this. This only works, by the way, ultimately, if you give your life to Christ. You say, I'm not going to do it myself anymore. I need you, God. I need you to come to my rescue. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. You pray the quietness of your heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I do believe you're the Son of God. And I recognize that I have not given my life completely. I've only given part of myself. 
I recognize this morning, God, that I need to give it all to you if I really want to see change. And Lord, I, I lay aside what I resigned before and I give it all. I, Lord, I give you my life today, my heart, my soul, my mind today. I give it all to you. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And today I choose to give my life to you today. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross, paid for my sins, and rose again from the dead. And I believe that through you I am saved. I give my life to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer, it's a new beginning today. I'm going to ask the worship, I'm going to ask the uh, prayer team to make their way up. We want to pray with you. Listen, if you want someone to stand with you and say, listen, I want to see some change in my life, will you pray for me? Or maybe you have a situation at work or home. We want to join together in prayer. Let's have that closing song, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Go ahead and do that. Thank you for being attentive. God bless you.